The State of Logic is a podcast dedicated to interviewing innovators and experts on topics impacting current events such as gun control, free speech, medical cannabis, and more. Their mission is to explore the logic behind people's opinions and ideas and inspire curiosity. Go ahead and check out the State of Logic podcast today. Welcome back to the one, the only Remso Republic. I'm your host as always, Remso W. Martinez. Go ahead and follow me on Twitter at Remso101. That's R-E-M-S-O 101. Holla at your boy and I'll holla back. You can go ahead and find me also on Minds.com because they're not fascist. And if you're into fascism, you can go ahead and check me out on Facebook at the one and only Remso W. Martinez at Remso Republic, whatever that little at sign is. You know, it's really weird when Facebook went to that because, like, you got the username and then you go ahead and you have the actual name and you never know which one to put in. But you can find me either way, super easy. Just Google Remso and I'll be one of your first people there. There's an Indian company renamed Remso Inc., but forget about those guys for trademark reasons. Welcome back. Season four has been an absolute blast. It's great to go ahead and, um, you know, get straight to the content that matters and when we go ahead and we take a break like we did during the holidays to come back and refocus on what's important everything has to focus on this the content it's easy just to go ahead and cover current events as we do with our live show as we do with our blogs and everything else but you know it takes a little bit of time to go ahead and look past you know the mud and the you know the the swamp waste and everything else and just get to the story then get to the questions that matter to you and you know, this season is all about the disruptors, as I've been talking about. You know, we're, we keep bringing on real journalists, real innovators, entrepreneurs, people that are trying to go ahead and place an emphasis, not just on, you know, that rugged individualism that I think all of you crave in your life and in your community, state, and nation. But it's the idea that, you know, something's not working. Um, some things, you know, they just, they, they have an expiration date. I don't know how I'm, how long I'm going to be doing this, but one thing I know is that we try and constantly diversify our content here. It's not often that you have a person calling himself a commentator and investigative journalist go out and do ghost hunts as we do for Haunted Republic on Patreon. It's not often that you'll see a guy who uh, does a podcast sponsor a uh, comic book, and I sponsored two libertarian comic books within 2017 alone. It was absolutely crazy. And, uh, you know, it's it's fun, and that's what we try and do. Our mission is to make freedom fun again. But... You know, you've got to understand that in this business, there are no rules and that you've got to, you know, you've got to put yourself out there, but you got to find a way to communicate with people. You have to try and put passion with your obligation, with your burden. A burden isn't just something that you feel you have to deal with, but something that you feel obligated to do because you spot an injustice. You spot something that's not right. And there's a person I brought on today who I think really kind of, you know, he, he matches that wholeheartedly. And he's one of the funniest MFers on Twitter. You've probably seen him once or twice on TV and the internet, uh, Infowars, Breitbart. I'm pretty sure the president retweeted him or tweeted him directly at one point. That's pretty freaking awesome to have Trump go ahead and, you know, give you a shout out. He is the one and only Trump guy, Dustin Gold. Dustin, what's going on, man? How are you, Remzo? Thank you very much for having me on. So you you have, I'm not going to call it strange because strange has a strange connotation, but you've got an exciting thing going on. You get to go across the country pretending to be Trump and people pay you to do it and you do a fantastic job. Absolutely beautiful. You're the best at it. You, you, you know, you're just absolutely winning. And then you go on and when it comes to covering, you know, domestic politics and, you know, breaking news and, you know, the, the rig and roll of the establishment machine, you're one of the most well-versed people I've encountered in this business. What's up with that? Well, here's the thing, just to give you a quick uh, backstory. I was in college in Philadelphia when 9-11 happened, and that was my introduction to paying attention to politics. 
I went to school for uh, industrial design. I come from a creative background. Uh, but once I got interested in politics and started paying attention, I, at the time, owned a marketing company, and I was listening to the radio, and I was living in New Haven, Connecticut at the time, and there was a mayor there, a very liberal guy named Mayor John DeStefano, who thought he was going to be the first in the nation to give out ID cards to illegal aliens. And something drove me to leave my office and go down to this meeting at a VFW, and I end up meeting a bunch of old people. This is pre-Tea Party. This is around the time when the Minutemen organization were down on the border, and this was under George W. Bush. And one of the things that I felt so guilty about is that I pushed a lot of my friends in college, a lot of my old high school friends to vote for Bush after I saw him stand on the rubble and say that he was going to get the terrorists. But then I saw the border wide open. And at that time, a lot of people weren't talking about illegal immigration as far as cheap labor and hurting American jobs, but that terrorists could come over the border. And within a couple of weeks, I ended up becoming the head of this organization. All these old World War II generation people kind of nominated me. I was in my 20s and I put on a business suit. These guys were wearing hard hats at the time and they were out on the street with bullhorns. And I knew I said, you know, I think we should put on business suits. We should look like the politicians, play their game, accept the world for what it is and then change it into what we want it to be. And I did that for a couple of years. I destroyed my company. Uh, I had a bunch of liberal clients in the state of Connecticut that I lost uh, for my marketing business. And I fought and fought and fought and fought. And we brought court cases. I worked with FAIR, Federation for American Immigration Reform, Center for Immigration Studies, bringing lawsuits against the state of Connecticut. And it was a great experience. I did a lot of radio at the time. I appeared on Lou Dobbs' old show. And when a Barack Obama won the election in 2008, I said, you know, I can't do this anymore. I can't afford to do it. I used all my money, destroyed my business. And I ended up falling into a business managing and developing political impersonators. So I ended up putting myself right back into politics. At that time, we were doing a lot of work for corporate, um, for corporate and association events. But I was in and around groups, corporations that were usually their political action committee arms that wanted to do a fun event. But I learned a lot about business and corporations through that. And uh, when this came around and Donald Trump announced that he was running, there was something that clicked with what he was saying. And the, a lot of my personality is very similar to his. I'm very blunt, uh, even in my normal life, whether it's uh, for good or bad. But I ended up saying this is a character that I've got to build my own version of, even though I was managing and developing other impersonators. And that's how I fell into this thing. Um, and it's quite interesting because uh, over the years I've studied Saul Linsky, uh, Andrew Breitbart, a lot of important people in politics from the right and the left. And uh, the, the character that I've created with Trump is very similar to Trump. And I believe that he has a full understanding of all of uh, – you know, of Alinsky tactics, of what Andrew Breitbart talked about. Donald Trump, I think, has been studying this stuff for the last 30 years. So my character is only a reflection of uh, some of the things that I believe that he understands. That's why it's such a fun character to play. And that's why some of the other guys I have that do Trump, which we use for a lot of corporate events, they can't go into depth the way that I do because I do most of my stuff on the fly. Exactly. And that's the incredible thing. But, you know, everything you just mentioned, I think most Americans, it's like their understanding of history started when Barack Obama was president. And they don't necessarily care about the things that went on in the Bush administration. They, you know, it's like they, they have to go back to like, you know, ancient scrolls to know what happened when Bill Clinton was president. You, you know, this 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 fall towards globalism and authoritarianism it didn't just happen with obama and it's not just stopping just because of trump um but it, it's absolutely insane that you know you were getting involved with this and you saw these seeds for destruction being planted by the progressives you know even during the bush administration um you know when it comes to conservative media today i'd like to think that you know the the right wing whether it be you know conservatives or these uh, trump populists or libertarians like myself i'd like to think that you know we're on the right side of things but w what is it about trump do you think that's leading us in a good direction do you think he's like reagan just kind of holding you know holding back the forces of tyranny or do you think he's actually pushing us in more of a freedom direction because ultimately that's what i think that matters it's not just good to be in power but it's good to actually do something with that 
No, I, you know, look, I was uh, born January 19th, 1981, the day before Ronald Reagan was sworn in, the day that the Iranians released the hostages. And it was funny when I was a kid, I had to look that up for a project, like what happened on the day you were born. So I always was very fond of Ronald Reagan and studied him uh, throughout my life. And I would say that Trump is, I think it'll be proven uh, in history. And when I say history, I mean, like another year from today, when we look back, Donald Trump is much more versed in, I think, all of this deep state shadow government stuff that's been going on. And he is like a general. I think he's like General Patton. This guy has no fear. I don't think this is about just holding back the forces of tyranny uh, for the coming months and the coming years. I think Donald Trump wants to be a transformative president. He wants to be a disruptive president. And I wouldn't doubt uh, with everything that's going on, and, and you look at the veil that he's lifted on um, Hollywood, on the liberal elite, on the rhinos. I mean, we all knew about rhinos, but a majority of Americans, like you say, don't necessarily follow these things or politics for them. History is only one year back. And he's lifting the veil on all this stuff at one time, the, the deep state, the intel community. And I think by the time uh, 2020 comes around, Donald Trump, because he's so disruptive, may actually run from the White House as an independent candidate and put an end to the two-party duopoly uh, once and for all. I truly believe that. I think he's setting himself up for that because he wants to be remembered as someone who's disruptive because I think the two-party system is just as dangerous to this country as, as the deep state and the shadow government. I think Donald Trump is a genius. I think he's studied all of this stuff for 30 years. Remember, uh, he had to do business with a lot of these corrupt politicians, whether it was getting zoning permits, getting regulations changed, being shaken down by politicians over the years. He's also whined, dined, and comped many of these people uh, from the liberal elites in Hollywood all the way to Washington, D.C. at his various properties. And Trump did not drink. He did not do drugs. But he was around when these people were using his properties. And I have always thought for the last two years that Donald Trump knows a lot more than he pretends he does. And you can even see that today where he'll tweet something. And three months later, we go, whoa, huh, Donald Trump was right. On March 4th, Donald Trump tweeted that he was being wiretapped. The Trump Tower was wiretapped. And then look what we see happen. Now, if Hillary Clinton won, obviously... Uh, all this would have been swept under the rug and it would have continued. If a Rand Paul or a Ted Cruz won, we would never see this. Donald Trump is a beast and he is there to fight this war. If, if he and it, it, it shocks me that you say this because I actually had a conversation similar to this a couple days ago. But, you know, I, you're not the first person to bring up the idea of Trump possibly running in 2020 as an independent. If he wanted to do that. Why didn't he just run against Bush and Gore in 2000 when he was, uh, you know, being courted by the Reform Party? Well, I, I I don't know if you've seen this, but Roger Stone, who's been a confidant of Donald Trump for 40 years, and by the way, Roger Stone, who was kicked off Twitter recently, retweeted me three days before he was kicked off. Uh, Roger Stone's a very weird character, but you if don't you say. Want, but if you want, <laughs> if. Hey, but if I, but I but I will say, you know, I, I didn't know much about him until a couple of years ago when he appeared on Infowars with Alex Jones for the first time for a 45 minute interview. And something about that guy, I was intrigued by him because he fits in with the, the Donald Trump clan. I mean, if you take Trump and Manafort, who Trump has known for 30 years, which probably we shouldn't be saying that now they're trying to separate from each other. But the characters that Trump had around him are very like mafia Dick Tracy type characters. But with Roger Stone, I don't know if you saw the documentary, Get, Get Me, Me Roger, Roger Stone. Stone. Yeah. Right. So the whole thing there was that Donald Trump, well, Roger Stone set up Pat Buchanan to run uh, under the Reform Party. And as soon as he got Buchanan in, Roger switched over to Donald Trump the next day and they turned Buchanan into a joke because Roger was trying to destroy the Reform Party for the purpose that Roger believed that he was somewhat loyal to the Republicans. But but Roger got thrown under the bus by the Republicans a long time ago when he was caught in a sex scandal and they totally ostracized him. He was one of the most powerful lobbyists at the time. Uh, but I think that this is part of their plan 
is that they are going to break the two-party system. I think Donald Trump would have run as a Democrat in this last election if he thought that he could win as a Democrat. Uh, remember, in the primary uh, debates, Donald Trump, when asked if he would support the Republican Party, was the only person who would not raise his hand on that question. So I think that that's coming. Now, in a couple of years, it may not fit into the plan or he may not have to do it. But I think as someone who's a disruptor uh, in business and now in politics, that is definitely on his mind and definitely was part of the plan. That, that's definitely interesting. And Dustin, I want to go ahead and continue this conversation, but we've got to go ahead and pay the bills around here. Folks, you're listening to the Remsor Republic. Hang on tight. We'll be right back after this. Join the Remsor Republic on Patreon today. 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 Hey, that's really good. Take the show on the go by subscribing to the Rims of the Republic on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, Google Play, and YouTube. Don't be left out. Hello, my name is Alex Merced, and I am a libertarian. I invite you to join me in spreading the message of liberty. Come down to alexmerced.com where you can find videos and lots of other media to help educate you about liberty and more. I've also created LearnEconomicsNow.com as a quick way to show anyone the basics about economics. Libertarian101.com, a great starting place to learn what is libertarianism, how to get involved, and how to move things forward. IntroTheLiberty.com, where you can learn more about how to spread the message of liberty through positive messaging from people like myself, Larry Sharp, and Michael Pickens. And don't forget LibertarianPodcast.com, where you can find an exhaustive list of Libertarian podcasts for you to enjoy. This is Alex Merced. Follow me on social media such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and more. And thank you very much. Hey guys, Tim Preuss here, and I wanted to take a minute and invite you to stop over to PreussPodcast.com and give our show a listen. We've got in-depth commentary on the issues that matter to you. These hookers. <laughs> fucking whores are out there. These They're... hookers, man, I tell you. Yeah, that's like the most contact I've had with the hooker. Is them the, yelling at them you. yelling at me on Twitter. <laughs> we break down the most pressing issues of our time. This what? large lady with, like, tight clothing on. Not appropriately linked tight clothing either. And we get the most intelligent analysis from friends of ours like Jeffrey Tucker. Uh, you pulled over engine trouble and, and what happened, what happened? Uh, I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's, uh, oh, I, oh, God. Seriously, though, we love putting on a show that both entertains and educates. We're growing and we'd be thrilled if you joined us. Check out PreussPodcast.com for more. That's P-R-E-U-S-S podcast.com. All right, everyone, welcome back. We're going to go ahead and pivot a little bit in our conversation from earlier. Um, Dustin, in the first half of the show, you went ahead and you discussed how, you know, getting involved in politics and all these things you were doing to try and, you know, pr protect our nation's borders, our culture, our language, things like that. Uh, you know, it, it took a, you know, it took a giant toll on your marketing business. And now you have a successful business, you know, managing all these different impersonators. I saw the, I saw the picture you post online of you and the guy as Sylvester Stallone. That was, that was so freaking cool. But you know, you're, you're doing that. Um, you're, you're doing other stuff online, getting yourself out there in terms of, you know, covering honest commentary and stuff like that. What, what makes now different than before? Why is it, you know, you were like, oh, I'm going to get back into the political scene, the journalistic scene, so to speak, when you already saw the destruction it could have on your life? I mean, it's I, I'd be lying if I said it hasn't taken a toll on my reputation. You know, I'm proud of everything I do. I stand by everything I say because I'd rather be me than be somebody else. But at the same time, I definitely tell people, understand what's going to happen once you go ahead and, you know, stick your head out there because you know the higher you climb up that ladder the more of your rear end they're going to go ahead and see and they're going to be able to you know sp you know spearhead you across you know a never-ending dystopian wave of 
crap, slander, lies, accusations, stupid bullshit you constantly have to deal with. I mean, it's it's nasty stuff, man. Well, it's funny. In my 20s as a bachelor uh, with that company and being involved with politics, all of my friends were between 70 and 80 years old, whether it was from that Miniman era uh, of the of the uh, pro-American revolution or it was from the Tea Party era. And I kind of backed out during that time. But now, I mean, and this is one of the greatest things about Donald Trump, he's inspired and it's a combination of him and then alternative media and the ability for average citizens to become journalists, to become broadcasters uh, with as much of these um, social media tools that we're fighting with Facebook and Twitter for censoring people because they've let it get out of control. And now we're fi- we finally have the tools to go out and fight them. But Donald Trump, I think, has inspired so many people to speak up, no more political correctness, don't be afraid. And finally, I'm seeing in my personal life the liberal friends and colleagues that you would have on Facebook, uh, relatives, that finally conservatives are willing to say, hey, shut up, you people are the crazy ones. I mean, I I don't know how much you want to get into your show, but I mean, we've allowed for now decades because of cultural Marxism, which was pushed by the Frankfurt School, to allow our morals, our values, our principles to be destroyed. And now we we were in this time right before Donald Trump where literally we are talking about like letting people talk about transgenderism to our kindergarten classrooms. And finally, people now are putting their foot down. And I don't see people as afraid anymore. I'm not afraid anymore. And I think people just need to speak up and speak out and get back to Uh, The Make America Great Again message that Donald Trump talks about, people say, when was that? I'd say probably about 30 to 40 years ago. (laughs) Actually, maybe pre-60s. But I think, you know, now's the time to do it. And I'm so inspired to see so many people on Twitter and Facebook that I've become friends with. There's so many young people under 35 years old now running for office under the MAGA agenda. So many people like yourself, like me that are not afraid anymore. And I think that's a great thing. And that's all because Donald Trump was willing to lead that charge. Definitely. And, you know, I, I tell people this all the time. I, I am proud of president Trump. I am very proud of him, but I don't regret not voting for him for president because, you know, I, I'll, I'll be blatantly honest. I believed a lot of the fake news I didn't Mm -hmm. necessarily understand him, you know, his mindset, you know, people, you know, it's like Mike Cernovich. I get in trouble a lot for, you know, quoting Mike Cernovich. I'm a big Mike Cernovich fan. If you want to understand Mike Cernovich, go read Gorilla Mindset. I went ahead and read the, uh, the art of the deal in high school, but I didn't really retain it. I read it as an adult and I was like, holy crap, like he's gaming you. And you wonder why he doesn't give excuses? I mean, the best piece of advice I've learned from Donald Trump is this. Your friends don't need excuses. Your enemies don't believe your excuses. Don't give excuses. When you have them constantly guessing what you're going to do next, but you know what you're going to do and you have a five-year strategy ahead, but they don't know what you're doing 10 seconds from now, like that's the best leverage you have on your opponents. And it's such a... It's such a crazy time to be alive, but what we're seeing right now is, uh, you know, one thing that I've always been opposed to is I, I call it, I call it conservative ink, so to speak. And I don't want to speak ill of any specific person, but you have a lot of these people, and I saw them. They're the ones that um, might write for Red State, for example. Some of them write the resurgent. I like Red State. I like the resurgent. But you have a lot of people that are saying, "Oh yeah, you know, I'm a Tea Party conservative." But they go ahead and they just recycle the same conservative, well, I'll just say the same establishment Republican talking points every once in a while. And then the moment you have someone like yourself, you have a Milo Yiannopoulos, you have others like that. You have these firebrands going out there and they're actually doing stuff to advance a conservative agenda, a pro-freedom agenda. They go ahead and they strike them down. Do you think the biggest problem we're getting in terms of, you know, criticism is really coming from the left because we expect it? Or do you think it's becoming from the right because it seems like it's like we're getting hit from our own side, so to speak? Well, I think one of the big things, and again, this is Donald Trump lifting the veil, is that even people we believe to be libertarian or conservative in, in our in our um, in our minds, he's lifted the veil on them and have shown, like certain people at Red State and others, are not really uh, that. They're more aligned with the rhino establishment. 
you know, not necessarily that they're part of the deep state or, or they want the status quo for corruption and stuff. But I was when I was younger, I tried to get involved with local Republican committees. And there was a lot of blue hairs in there, a lot of old people. They did not want to give up their power. You would think they would go, oh, a 20 year old kid wants to come and put up signs. They tried to shun me and my friends that came in to try to help. And I think that's what we're seeing. You know, is Donald Trump some ideological conservative? No. But I think what you said, he knows what the world is today and he knows where he's trying to advance it in four years from now. He's got that vision and he and he's going to try to get there. And I think, you know, I, you know, someone who I respected for a long time was Glenn Beck. I followed him for for many years. He came from the New Haven area for a while when I was there. And uh, after seeing the path that he decided to take during the Trump presidency, I thought Beck should have gotten on board and tried to help shape the Trump presidency instead of trying to tear him down. And we can get into a thousand reasons why that occurred. But I think there's a lot of missed opportunity. A lot of these conservatives should have gotten on board, got to the table and tried to help shape some of the agenda and some of the policies. I, I definitely understand that. And I mean, you know, and this is a good case study, but, you know, for people that have not been listening for a while and you're coming on to the show now, which, by the way, our numbers every season are just going absolutely insane. Thank you, all new listeners. But, you know, I, I tell people this all the time. I voted for Evan McMullen, who um, was an independent candidate who was on the ballot in Virginia. I believe that he was better than Gary Johnson because Gary Johnson wants you to bake a gay Nazi wedding cake at gunpoint and he likes Planned Parenthood and he was okay with the EPA. I mean, Gary Johnson was a terrible candidate and I voted for McMullen because I'm like, even if he's lying to me, at least he's telling me what I want to hear. And you know, Gary six, Johnson. Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> Gary Johnson. Gary? Who's, who is Gary Johnson? Let's take some pot pills. They're so good. What I actually is Aleppo? I'll just tell you real quick. I almost did a project with him. We, I had a contract with someone to film a documentary of his campaign. Now, I had met Gary four years earlier before he was popping all of his pot pills, and he actually had some really great ideas. So I was excited when the opportunity came to do this documentary. I got on a phone call for about an hour and a half with him this time around. And I said, what the hell is this guy on? <laughs> He's been taking way too many. I said, Gary, what happened to all those policies I talked to you about on John Stossel's show that time in the green room? And you had all these great policies and a lot of it made sense. I didn't think he was a, uh, a, a candidate that could win because he's just kind of weird. But he had so many great things, and it was all lost this time around. I would have never supported him. I actually backed out of the project, and I told my partner at the time, you can have it. And it was a complete failure because all Gary wanted to do was go skiing. And, uh, he, and you know, it was all part of pushing his pot company. But that's yeah. a story for another day. Oh, my gosh. That's insane. But uh, back, back, to what, back to what I was saying. I mean, Evan McMullen, like right now, he's, he's – like honestly, he's an abomination. He, he's a neoconservative at best. He's a total progressive at worst. And he's an example of somebody that represents the status quo. But and, you know, it's crazy because the person I voted for being everything I hate about politics and the person I thought was going to be everything I hate about politics is the reformer my generation needs. And the biggest things that bothered me about Trump were, you know, oh, we need to censor the Internet. Oh, we're all these possible terrorists. We need to go after their families. He he just didn't seem like a very pro-freedom guy. But now you look at what he's doing and, oh, my gosh, like he's 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 doing stuff I like. Where, where do you think was the disconnect of most people like myself? Because I'd like to think that right now I'm pretty much in step with this agenda. It's just yeah. that back then I was like, holy shit, like what's the difference between him and Hillary Clinton? No, exactly. Well, and I totally know where you're coming from because you had liberals that said, you know, oh, Donald Trump is some evil conservative. You had conservatives that were saying that he was a liberal. You had libertarians saying that he was a neocon. And that's just because Trump kind of threw a lot of stuff out there. But when I, and I will say this, I listened to in detail every single speech every single speech that he gave uh, throughout the primary and the general election. And some of the core policy speeches are where you really had to listen because he sat down with Stephen Miller, one of his top aides, to put some of these things together. And that's where I would hear uh, the real details in the immigration plan. And I actually was saying at the time on foreign policy, he was actually one of the most libertarian-minded 
candidates. Now, you had to get through the rhetoric and the tough talk that he would throw out there to sound like a General Patton. But really, he was the only one talking about scaling back foreign wars. And I think what you're seeing now uh, for people that pay attention, you'd have to be kind of wonkish to understand. But he, I believe in the Middle East and the realigning of Saudi Arabia and other things that are going on right now is that he sat down and he said, look, I know our own deep state funded ISIS and funds a lot of these proxy armies. We're going to clean up the mess from now on. If we're going to fight over oil pipelines or land or whatever, we could do that at the negotiating table. And I think that's what's going on now. I mean, that was pretty ballsy to go to Saudi Arabia in the first uh first quarter of his administration and give that speech. And now all of a sudden you see all these major changes going on. Gotcha. I mean, no, that, that, that totally makes sense. So it, it, it's such a strange time to be alive. And this is one of those situations where I'm, I'm so glad to say I was wrong. I like being wrong. As weird as that sounds, I am perfectly okay being wrong in what I thought, because ultimately, you know, what's good for the country is good for the country. So what if I look like, you know, I was wrong. Everything I said is stupid. Like, I'm OK admitting that. I just wish other people who are really good intentioned people, they're great freedom fighters and activists and, you know, liberty minded folks. I just wish they would get that through their head. Hey, you know, I'm wrong all the time. I mean, the first 10 months of this administration has obviously been rocky. We're in the middle of an American restoration. We're in the middle of uh, basically a civil war. Uh, and a revolution to take back our country from the, the deep state that I don't think even the people that pay attention have any idea of what this really is and how big this is. Uh, but I think, you know, I'm wrong all the time. I get nervous. I stopped the last few months. But before that, every time Trump would do something like we're going to put more troops in Afghanistan or this, and I, I would go, oh, my God, here it is. There's a coup. He's been taken over or he was a sellout. He's just a continuation of Obama, Clinton, Bush. And uh, and then I wait a couple of weeks and I see the results and I go, oh, my God. And now in the last couple of days, and I know that this won't air, so it doesn't you could cut this part. But in the last uh, few days, uh, we've seen that there's been actual planted fake news stories coming out of major networks like ABC and Bloomberg just to throw the people off. I mean, th this is outrageous how much the deep state and establishment are fighting back, but it's a war and they're going to continue to do that. And what matters most are regular people that, you know, are just your everyday folks going out and trying to do something amazing, which is be proactive. And when it comes to, you know, the disruptive technology that is the Internet and everything else, I, I think we're doing the right thing at the end of the day. So, Dustin, for, for people out there that are saying, you know, I don't know if I want to get involved, whether it's just, you know, getting involved in a local Tea Party group, getting, you know, starting a blog, maybe – letting people know what's going on, trying to go be an actual journalist and report real news. When it comes to just promoting the idea of liberty, individualism, you know, creative disruption, what's your message to those people? I would say to people, look, at the, at the very minimum, if there is a network or alternative media website that you're following, you know, uh, you know, everything from a Remzo to to an Infowars, to a Gateway Pundit, to a Halsey News, whatever, you know, bare minimum, you know, donate, you know, a dollar, five dollars every month. If you can't put your name out there, if you're afraid from work and, and if you're not, I say you've got to just pick up your phone, get on Twitter, start periscoping, start putting out videos, spread the word, take, you know, most of the people in, in this movement today don't care if you take their content and repost it. Take what you learn from them and then put it in your own words. The only way you're going to wake up your friends that you think are liberal, not the crazy ones, but the uninformed ones, and I do this with my sister and mother and other people in my family, is you've got to take what you learn, put it in your own words, and deliver it to them, and hopefully you're going to wake some more people up. I mean, this is an American restoration, and I believe it's the only chance in my lifetime, and I've been paying attention to politics for a long time, there will never be another Donald Trump. If the establishment beats him, destroys him, impeaches him, this is like the last stand. You will never have a guy who's a billionaire, who's willing to put it all on the line, who's willing to fight and get in people's faces. He's an anomaly, and it's never going to happen again. So you've got to just preach and speak up and speak out and try to reach your friends and wake everybody up. And then we will make America great again. It's going to be unbelievable. <laughs> one of the 
<laughs> One of the greatest Americas of all time. So incredible. So great. So incredible. Way better than South America, you know? <laughs> Okay, it's unbelievable. Uh, just like there is only one Donald Trump, there's only one Dustin Gold. Dustin, if people want to follow you on Twitter, all that jazz, catch up with your work. How could they do so? Uh, you could go to trumpguy.com, trumpguy.com, or on Twitter at, at trumpguytv, at trumpguytv, and then you can get to everything else from there. Dustin, thank you so much for joining the program today. Had an absolute blast. We'll have to get you on again soon. Thank you, Remzo, and I appreciate everything you're doing. And, uh, you know, keep up the good fight and keep pushing out your projects and your content. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much, folks. As always, go ahead and follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Go ahead and help support Team Republic for as little as $1 a month on Patreon. Go to www.patreon.com slash Remso Republic. And as always, subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you're listening to the show right now. You can leave us a five-star rating and review and help us get in those trending charts. As always, be good to your neighbor. Go out and treat yourself and tune in next time, America. I'm Remsel W. Martinez. Good night. Stay up to date with the latest news and updates by visiting RemzoRepublic.com. Hey, this is Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran, host of the Armed Lutheran Radio Podcast, reminding you that the podcast you're listening to is a proud member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Check out all the great content at selfdefenseradio.net.